Good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd United Methodist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Announcements for the week. First of all, the uh, second Sunday lunch next week will be at P.F. Chang's. Hopefully you know where P.F. Chang's is, right on the intersection of Central and Bethany. Uh, Living Young also has a scheduled outing uh, to see a play, Flanagan's Waiting, it's at Adams Contemporary Theater. That will be March 24th at 3 p.m. Cutoff for tickets is next weekend after the next Sunday service. We will buy the tickets and uh, be ready to go. Potluck breakfast on Easter Sunday morning, which is March 31st. Sign-up sheet is available in the back to sign up for what you'd like to bring to share with everyone for breakfast. And then Easter, we will have a sunrise service at 7 a.m. And uh, we'd like to have everybody there with some beautiful services at the Good morning. Good morning. Is it on? Okay. I'm seem, I seem to be uh, button pushing a handicapped, and so I'm dealing with that. Okay. We have a lot of good things going on. After the, the sunrise service, we have a brunch, and you can sign up for the brunch out in the back uh, if you want to bring stuff for the brunch. But we do have a brunch after Easter uh, sunrise service. And the sun doesn't rise till 7.15, it starts at 7, so we're really going to get the seat surprise. <laughs> so, anyway, um, what was he? Oh, I have one other thing. I got my lupus leader. You guys all get these if you live in lupus, right? Yeah. Okay, well, then I was looking at this, and uh, last year they closed the farmer's market uh, sign-ups uh, in January. Well, they have it this year. So, if we wanted to do something at the farmer's market, we could. However, we need to have someone do that. But uh, I think there was at least one person who said they thought we, it would be good if we had a presence at the farmer's market. So, whoever that was, you got it. <laughs> you, you could fill out the information and, and uh, sign up online. So, and you don't have to sign up for every month. I don't think that's a, something that maybe people would know, but you can sign up for just certain months. All right, now let's stand and sing How Great Dog. <laughs>
And we were all kind of standing in the kitchen area. All the women were. The guys were already playing cribbage. But the women were kind of standing around, serving soup, looking, you know, jacking. And Jane, Jeannie brought the big, these three desserts, and so we're checking those out. And, <laughs> and somebody goes, look at Nate. And we looked over there, and Nate was sitting in a chair like, Come on, we gotta play games now. It's time to play games. And it was even kind of prancing in the seat, you know. <clears throat> and uh, somebody took a picture of it. I can't remember who it was. It was you. Okay. Good, because I want that picture. But uh, the next day he passed away. And so I was thinking about, of course, on Thursday I was kind of a mess and I was totally, you know, feeling bad for myself because I just lost my best friend. And, uh, you know, when somebody spends all their time with you every day, it gets to be a real bad habit. So I don't even think if you dislike them, you'd still miss them. <laughs> but anyway, I was wondering about, you know, when I was when I saw Nate sitting on that chair and looking at all of us like, come on, I thought, you know, that's kind of his purpose, isn't it? He kind of keeps us going. And... Uh, and I started thinking about after he had passed away, you know, what was his purpose? And because I kind of had this idea about purpose in my head about this. And so I thought, you know, Nate's purpose in life was to bring joy. He had, when he walked in the room, his head was up, his tail was wagging, and he was ready to go meet everybody. And he had to meet everybody. And so, you know, he was kind of like the big greeter in the, the whole thing. And so <clears throat> I thought, you know, that's what I'm missing from this, this scripture. This is Jesus' purpose. His purpose is to be there, to be doing these things and be, be making sure that people know about God's love and how God uh, never abandons them and how they can, you know, believe in God and that, you know, their lives will be richer. And I thought, okay, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking about the scripture where Jesus walks in here and uh, the temple was built so it had these porches on three sides. And so they were very large and they were, they were kind of like our narthex. You know, that's where you hung out before you went into the worship area. Anyway, so he goes to this, the temple, and he looks at, you know, here's, you know what the cows and the sheep are doing on the floor, you know. It smells like a barn. And it's noisy because they're bartering and they're buying things and the birds are making noise. And all of a sudden, it's like a marketplace. It's not like a place of worship. And Jesus gets upset at that because this is God's house. This is the temple. This is very important to the Jews. And here they are selling animals. And he gets very upset. And it depends on what version you, you read. Mine is NRSV, and uh, it doesn't have a lot of conversation in there, but there are, are things that he says in other versions of it about why are you doing this? He doesn't only just say something about taking the doves out of there, but he, you know, he makes a whip and runs the cows and the sheep and probably goats out. No, goats wouldn't be there because they're clubbed with their thumbs for out. Okay. Um, but anyway, he's throwing them out and... and, and so they're taking off down the street, and of course, the people that own them are taking off after them too. And then the money changers are there in case you don't have exact change for your giving. So <clears throat> he doesn't like this because it sounds like, well, you know, I got a five dollar bill, but I don't want to get four dollars. I go away and get change me. So it's really annoys him that they are not taking their worship seriously. That they're going in there with this casual attitude and they're not prepared to worship and hear God. So that's what he is upset about. It's not anything that we wouldn't feel if we were doing something really serious and nobody took it serious. Kind of like the rice and beans. <laughs> I had very few rice and beans come up. And so I know that I have not a whole lot of power over you guys. <laughs> I can't make you do anything. You know, I feel like I do with my kids. So anyway, but uh, <clears throat> you have all that going on. And so the dudes, you know, the priests and the, or whoever happens to be there that's waiting for them, sort of like the ushers, I suppose, you know, they go, well, what time do you have to prove that you should do something? 
because if you thought it was noisy before, I'm sure it was really chaotic after you throw the coins on the floor and run the cows out. And they and he says, tear down this building and I will create it in three days. Well, we know from the three day words what it is. That it's Jesus' resurrection. That the temple is not a building. The church is not a building. The church is its people and how they do worship. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about don't be casual. Don't be uh, uh, coming in and thinking, yeah, I'm going to spend an hour here and I'm going to leave. And, you know, it's, it's just something I do. He wants you to worship. He wants you to have time to think deeply about who you are in Christ. So he says this really interesting thing. He says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And that is a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. It says, this is from David. It says, it is, it is zeal for your house that has consumed me. Because David wanted to build the temple himself. Never got to. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. He says, it hurts me when people don't take you seriously. And this is David. And now it's Jesus. He says, don't do that. Don't take God casually. It's like people that say, oh my God, I just want to smack him in the face. That's a, that's a direct violation of the Ten Commandments, for one thing. You don't use God's name in vain. We've gotten so casual about it all. And we don't realize that there is a relationship there that we should certainly respect. <clears throat> and we should do something about worshiping God is an important thing. <clears throat> the interesting thing that I think... Uh, really kind of sums it all up is that the last verse, verse 22 is in the past tense after he was raised from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken about the three days after you know, so we go all the way back years later this little paragraph in here. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered. He had said the three-day thing. Oh, I get it. So they get real excited about it. They actually know what's happening. And they know that that scripture is not something that is foreign to the Jews. It's part of the Old Testament. Jesus put the Old Testament all the way. He was a Jew. Yeah, the truth is in the Old Testament as much as it's in the New Testament. But the New Testament is where we get to know Jesus, the Son of God, human, vulnerable, and that's who we have to worship. So you can see that Scripture is really important because Scripture <clears throat> was read during their worship, same as us. And that was what it was about. That's what the priest would get up and talk about, or whomever said it. But, uh, but anyway... So we go, we go to the 18th century, and we've got John Wesley, and he's an Anglican priest, and he doesn't like the way that Anglicans are doing things because all they're doing is going to worship. And there's no way that people can show their witness. And so he thinks that they need to do some things. Well, he went to school in Oxford, and so was his church. It was in a little town. It was in the sprawl of Oxford, so it was a little town, a little village, but it was connected to Oxford. So he started there, and he thought, you know what? They don't have a church to do things in because the church is only a worship, a sanctuary. So he goes, I'm going to buy a building. So he buys the foundry <clears throat> out in the sticks. He fixes it all up, makes it a hospital, a school, a daycare center. A, a, a lunch room for uh, indigent people. He makes it the place where they have classes about how to be a Christian and how to follow. And you have to pay to get into them. And you can get thrown out of them if you do something or another. <laughs> so he's really serious about this. And he starts working on this. Well, when he moved the church, well, when the, the Methodists that had moved to America got there, they wanted 
some guidelines because there weren't any. They weren't Anglican anymore. They were something else. So he gets, he gets starts writing down these things. You know, these are the things that we do. And one of them, they're called the Articles of Religion. They're in the front of any book of worship. And they, uh, one of them was that scripture contains all that one needs for salvation. Just think, if you read your Bible, you might find something that actually helps you. And that's, that's what we need to encourage others to do. You know, we've got somebody that doesn't really know much about, you know, this whole thing. Maybe they actually believe, but they don't know what they believe or how they believe. And right now, you can get any version you want. Anything that makes you feel good, you can get. So it's very important. Scripture is sufficient because it does not need to be supplemented with any other revelation. Not, not knowledge, but revelation. Affirmation is rooted in this affirmation, this, this scripture being sufficient, is actually a traditional post-pre-Methodist, post-Reformation idea. So the Presbyterians think the same thing. The, the Lutherans think, and you know, that that's the idea, is the scripture. Now, the reason they did this was because the Catholic Church liked to make a lot of other things important, like mortal sins. <clears throat> you know, if you, you're going to you do a mortal sin, and some of them are really random, you know, you're going to go to hell. But that's how they got people in line back then. It doesn't work now, you know. People aren't as worried about it. In the Wesley Bible, it says this about Scripture. <clears throat> Holding this view does not mean that Scripture is our only source of knowledge for everything. We can still learn new things about the world and about the historical situation, known as context, in which the Bible was written, and this knowledge helps us interpret Scripture. But we can trust the Bible, that the Bible does not lack anything we need in order to know and love God. This is called a core term. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is our purpose. Our purpose is to not have a great idea about this. Our, our purpose is to use scripture, to use worship to guide us, and to use the, everything we know. You know, my thought was if, if we use scripture, and if we worship with scripture, then we can get to know and love God. And then we will want to desire to do God's work, God's will. That's where we get everything else. You know, missions, uh, schools, hospitals. You know, that's where the Methodist hospital system came from. It came from Wesley going, you got to have hospitals. You got all these workers Especially in the 18th century, I mean, we're talking the Industrial Revolution. We're having 10-year-olds, you know, making things in factories and stuff. So we need to understand that our purpose as a church is worship, which is, stands on Scripture and on tradition, our tradition. And that when we have these sufficiently, our desire is to follow God. Our desire is to follow God's will. We suddenly are not as important at doing what we want to do <clears throat> as we are at doing God's will. And Jesus would tell you, along with Wesley and, and uh, Mark Luther and all the rest of them, <clears throat> and every pope you can think of, you have gifts, you have skills that you can use for God. Nate was a dog and his was joy. And yours are things too. There are things that you can do that exhibit. Oh, one time I was at, I went to art school, so I went to school you know, with people that had different colored hair and bald heads and never washed. Um, but uh, they were really great at art. But um, <clears throat> that was their focus. Anyway, one of them asked me one time, we we're sitting in there, you know, everybody's painting. I always painted sitting on the floor which is probably why my back doesn't work. But, you know, sometimes, how they use a little something, you know. So we're all, and, and it gets really quiet when we're really working because we're really focused on what we're doing. And one of the guys came up to me and started talking to me, and he goes, why are you so happy all the time? And I said, I am. <laughs> I didn't know that. And he said, I said, I probably, because 
I believe in God and I believe that, you know, I'm taken care of and I, I, I can be happy. Mm -hmm. He goes, I don't know about that. And I said, well, you need to start thinking about that because there is a God. I can guarantee you there's a God. Anyway, we had this long conversation about it and everything. But, but that was something that I had no idea I was broadcasting. So think about what you broadcast. Think about how you open yourself up to those kinds of questions from other people and how we can do that and how we can find our collective purpose for this church. What will it be? Amen. Amen. <laughs>